As animation slowly becomes an older and larger entertainment medium, being passed down from generation to generation of artists, filmmakers, and viewers, it's become easier for historians to look back and explore the merits of each era of animation. The stories of most of the earliest animation studios are pretty well documented, considering how it was considered a novelty in its infancy, but exactly what those eras are is a little harder to pin down. While there is a somewhat official consensus that splits the history of animation into five major chapters, it's not as though most of them have clear cutoff dates. Sometimes a lot of major events happen within a specific time frame, but it's hard to narrow down on one event as the game changer, which lends the medium's history a looser, more freeform narrative than others, that many artists from around the world have slowly contributed to the culture we experience today. So, let me guide you through the five best documented eras of animation, how they evolved into each other, and what I consider to be the ultimate misconception when it comes to the bigger picture of animation history. Before colour, before sound, before film was even a legitimate industry, the rapid movement of drawn images to create the illusion of movement is a trick that can debatably be traced back to the DAWN OF MAN! But for now, let's just call the Dawn of Man Paris 1888. That was when French inventor Emile Renaud patented a mechanical moving picture machine he soon fashioned Theatre Optique, and made several short productions with translucent drawings presented at the Musée Grévin during the 1890s. But to most people, the proper history of animation starts in the United States in the 1900s, with the enchanted drawing and humorous phases of funny faces. France didn't completely lose out on the glory, as the incoherent inspired phantasmagory is sometimes brought up as well. But as the 20th century inched onward, it was clear that the US had the biggest hand in shaping the industry of animation. This is where the most innovative techniques were established, the biggest names in its early history were born, and its first big stars debuted. Gertie the Dinosaur, Felix the Cat, Coco the Clown, a lot of X the Ys you'll notice. Many other countries were still blossoming at different speeds, with Italy and Argentina notably beating America to the punch in feature-length animation, with 1917's El Apostol. The one major restriction most of these animated subjects had was a lack of sound aside from some dude playing a piano in the corner. There were a few experiments in bringing cartoon and sound together as the 20s commenced, but it wasn't yet seen as necessary. Critics from this era were tired of animation by the late 20s, however, considering it a novelty that had outstayed its welcome. And when you consider most of them look like high school doodles, I can see where they're coming from. Another big drawback to animation in this era was that it was still evolving. Moving backgrounds were a special occasion, character designs were thin and basic, and the movements were very rigid. I'm not saying these animators should get good, because A, they're all dead, and B, there were no masters to learn from or classic influences aside from art movements and newspaper comics. A very unfortunate fact about this era, and of early film in general, is that not much of it has survived. El Apostol was destroyed, many shorts from even big names like Felix the Cat have been lost to time, and most tragically, Emile Renaud threw five of his seven films in the scene in 1913 when he was suffering from depression. One can only guess what we could learn from the silent era if we had more of it safely preserved. Pretty much every book you'll ever read on animation will tell you that the Golden Age began on November 18th, 1928 with the premiere of Steamboat Willie, one of the first successful sound cartoons and the public debut of Mickey and Minnie Mouse. With music, sound effects and personality animation now mandatory fixtures of the presentation, competition began to get fierce, not just from competing studios, but between each studio's own characters. This era reflected some tough times in America, from the Great Depression to World War II, and unintentionally a period full of casual racism, objectification, and fear-mongering of other cultures. It bears reiterating, history is for learning from, not repeating. If this era is known for anything these days, it's either for the peak period of Fleischer Studios, producing some of the darkest and most surreal shorts ever screened to a mainstream audience, or the pioneering days of the Disney animated canon, 
with feature-length movies like Snow White, Pinocchio, and Fantasia pushing the medium into consideration as high art. Looney Tunes also entertained kids and adults alike, with many of their most acclaimed early material being produced in the 40s and early 50s. It was an era full of ambition and personality, and both many different unique art styles that are still influences on media today. The so-called golden age of animation is mostly referring to the North American branch of the industry, but as film became a bigger part of everyday life globally, more countries built their own industries. The results were largely more experimental and geared towards adults than American cartoons, but some very important milestones in the history of music videos and stop motion were still made back in this era. Back in America, the Golden Age died a slow and painful death throughout the 1950s for many reasons. Film studios giving their animation divisions less time and money, the early masters getting old and worn out, Walt Disney turning his attention to live action and theme parks, and most importantly, the popularization of television. Am I glad he's frozen in there and that we're out here? While a cutoff date for the Golden Era isn't as clear as with the Silent Era, I think 1959 and 1960 are suitable candidates, with the underwhelming performance of Disney's Sleeping Beauty in the former year, and the premiere of the Flintstones in the latter, both pushing a belief that cheaper animation was becoming more successful than the expensive and lavish productions of yesteryear. Since television budgets were a lot tighter than for film, a lot of major studios begrudgingly switched to TV, but none were quite as successful as Hanna-Barbera. Their angular designs and dialogue-heavy episodes ensured that animation could have a new identity on the small screen. They became the new leading name in animation with shows like The Flintstones, Johnny Quest, and Scooby-Doo Where Are You, only being rivaled by filmation in the 70s. As this era wore on, TV sucked up more of the family audiences with an onslaught of advertisements using animation to make the products more appealing, teenagers solving mysteries with whatever animal they were stuck with, animated Star Trek adventures written by some of the people from the original series, and a sex offender teaching kids an offensive mental health slur. Perhaps this might clarify it better. He is... While television became a big business worldwide, the budgets weren't getting much bigger, so television animation became a very stagnant medium in the 70s and 80s, not helped by the loosening of FCC advertising regulations in the latter decade, leading to an overload of cartoons solely created to advertise children's toys. There's a reason these three decades are sometimes referred to as the Dark Age of Animation. At least there were some pretty good Christmas specials. And on the silver screen, more animated films began to target adults, with even more abstract art styles and mature themes. Two words into the discussion more than any other. Ralph Bakshi. Even in other countries, animation continued to be seen as an adult-oriented medium, with art pieces often being made for adults by adults. The country whose animation industry grew the most in this era was arguably Japan, with anime gradually filling up TV and movie theatres and developing a style all its own. It's a little ironic that this is referred to as the television era, because American TV in particular gradually turned into the medium's biggest adversary, having the least artistic merit of the whole field by the mid-80s. It was a tumultuous period that saw a lot of the old masters retire and or pass away, given the medium had been around for an entire human lifetime by the end, but fresh blood was starting to emerge that would usher in a new lease on an old artistic field. It's even harder to pick a date where the Renaissance era began, because so much happened throughout the mid to late 80s. Pixar was founded in 86, Steven Spielberg got more involved with animated movies like An American Tale and Who Framed Roger Rabbit, The Simpsons debuted bringing more adult viewers to animation, and Disney went from its rock bottom of losing at the box office to the Care Bears movie in 1985, to reviving their fairy tale traditions with The Little Mermaid in 1989. These events and many more set the stage for a decade of technological advancements and mainstream awareness of animation like never before. New household names were being created every year, both on TV and in theatres, and the stigma of animation being just for kids faded as more shows came out with adults in mind. 
Because of how far animation expanded in this era, I won't go over every single major milestone, especially not abroad as other countries' industries were growing just as rapidly, but I do want to bring attention to this little show in New Zealand called Brotown that started in this era. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. But this raises a little debate. While the 1990s are unanimously considered a part of this era for obvious reasons, when it ended has been harder to pin down. Some will say with the turn of the millennium, while others will consider the early to mid 2000s as well. I'm more inclined to the latter direction, which still makes this one of the shortest eras, but I might even end up including the 2010s to some extent. The reason for this has to do with generational divisions. A lot of the innovators from the 80s and 90s were still getting work and influencing the direction of the medium. And even if you're of the opinion that the 2000s was a worse time for animation, it was still a period of relative stability and expansion of prior ideas. And that includes online, with web animation dating back to the 90s, but becoming a bigger field in the 2000s as internet speeds and storage increased. This is still very recent history, so who knows how these years will be divided in another couple decades, when we have more perspective on what lived on and what didn't. And that brings us to the present day. Cartoons for kids and adults live side by side, as do computer animation and hand-drawn animation, major studios like Pixar and DreamWorks, and the stories told are aiming to be more inclusive to other cultures and identities. The modern era isn't really a part of history, yes, it's today, what's happening right here, right now. So I'm gonna let you watch the stuff coming out right now and have some fun. But before you head off, I'll just let you know on what I think is the ultimate misconception with each era of animation history, that they each have exactly one style. This. I don't like this. It's a massive generalization of each period. As I've been over, not only has animation progressed at different paces all around the world, but even within the United States, each decade has birthed many completely different styles, tones, characters, themes, and worlds. It's worth knowing more about these time periods than only the most popular fictional character to debut in each, because then you'll have a better understanding of what can be achieved with the medium, and more influences than you'd never have known about otherwise. Goodbye for now.